DLC takes on many forms in gaming. Sometimes it's a free add-on or update to the main game, which keeps fans coming back to it from time to time. Until they put a subscription service on it a decade later and hides most of it and the main game content behind a paywall. GTA 5 really leaps off a cliff. Sometimes DLC is an extra bit of content which developers didn't have time to put into the main game. And sometimes DLC is a planned bit of content to developers intend to release before the next game comes out, as is the case with From Software. Before Shadow of the Earth Tree's release, there are seven main DLCs that From Software has released, not including Sekiro's. Six of these are from the Dark Souls trilogy, and one is from Bloodborne. So I guess this should be called Souls 1 DLCs ranked. Either way, which of these DLCs are worth your time and money, and which of them are a massive waste of them? Spoiler alert, none of them are, but let's rank them anyway. Also, please subscribe. I would really love it if we could get this channel monetized. Stops me from depending on Twitch. Speaking of which, if you don't know already, I'm on Twitch. Same name as here, but with an underscore between the name. Anyways, let's get on. Number 7, Crown of the Sunken King, Dark Souls 2. As I said, none of these DLCs are a waste of time or money, but when it comes to which I recommend the least, Crown of the Sunken King unfortunately takes that title. The first DLC in Dark Souls 2, you can immediately see the improvement from the main game. The level design brings out the better parts of the game, though not entirely flawless. One of the most prominent parts of the DLC, the level design and the lore, is this big sleepy dragon boy you come across at the start. If you want to look more into the lore of this DLC, I strongly recommend you do so. It's quite interesting. Looking at the bosses, we have three per DLC in Dark Souls 2, and the first you'll most likely come across is Alana, the Squalid Queen. Not a bad fight by any means, but it does feel like the fight we should have had against Nishandra, which is fitting because they are both short of the Manus. My big issue with this fight is when Alana summons Velsat, if she did this just once per fight, I wouldn't mind. Sadly, she can do it as many times as she wants, which I found out the hard way. This makes crowd control in the room a massive pain, because there's practically nothing to defy them apart from Alana's teleporting. After you beat her, however, you also fight the main boss of the DLC, Sin, the slumbering dragon. The only good dragon boss in this game, Sin's biggest flaw is the fact that your weapon is almost guaranteed to break before you finish off the big lad. His toxic infliction isn't great either, but not as bad as I initially thought. That being said, what brings Crown of the Sunken King to the bottom of the ranking? Well, Dark Souls 2 had this interesting idea where they would have the optional boss of the DLC be a co-op boss, all made with a really tough run back made specifically for co-op. There are two big problems with this. One, what if the online servers aren't available? And two, what if you don't want to summon, which is something a lot of people tend to not want to do? This means that completionists like me have to trudge through the worst runbacks in FromSoft history just to get to an optional boss. And I hate to break it to you, but the optional bosses in Dark Souls 2 are absolute dog shit. For the Thunken King, we have Gank Squad. You know, Gank Squad, Tom, Dick and Harry. Those three guys, the most iconic trio in history. Yeah, no. This fight should be the worst in the series. A lazy gank with a terrible run back and a straight up recycling of NPCs put into a boss fight. It's a shame this fight exists because it severely devalues the whole DLC. Number 6, Ashes of Ariandel, Dark Souls 3. This is practically a one fight DLC, but oh man, what a fight. Sister Frida is a fight I mentioned in the DLC bosses video that I recommend you watch. It's a good one for my standards. Anyway, that one fight is unbelievably good and is a perfect fit for the theme and aesthetics of the Ashes of Ariandel DLC. The world itself is beautiful and probably my favourite snow level in the trilogy, discounting one that we'll get to later. The level design itself is pretty decent, with wolves, magic trees, big flies and a pretty nice looking village. One thing that I don't mention however is the other fight of the DLC. What was it again? Oh, that's right, it's the bloody Champion's Grave Tender and Grave Tender's Great Wolf. I don't know if you can tell, but NPC boss fights are by far my least favourite concept. Even more so than puzzle bosses, because at least they try to be creative. This fight, though, an NPC, three wolves, and a big wolf when the Grave Tender reaches half health. The moves aren't even creative, looking way too similar to Vought's move set, which makes me wish that we got a late game Vought instead of this horse shit. But yeah. Considering the other DLC in this game, Ashes of Ariandel pales in comparison, but when it hits, it hits. Number 5, Crown of the Ivory King, Dark Souls 2. The final DLC of Dark Souls 2 
it's almost fitting that the Crown of the Ivory King has both the best and worst bosses in the game. Starting off the DLC, we have my favourite snail level, Ilium Lois. It's not perfect by any means, but from aesthetics alone, Frozen Ilium Lois is gorgeous, which is a welcome change from the dark, mucky looking level from the main game. The first boss in the DLC is Invisible Stan. Wait, that, that's not right. Oh, okay, the first boss in DLC is Arva, the King's Pet, who at first appears invisible if you arrive without the Eye of the Priestess. If you do have it though, prepare for a pretty fun fight. While not on the same level as something like Sif, for example, Arva is their own thing, and by golly do they prove it. It genuinely surpassed my expectations, despite the fact that we had a moment where both of us died, and for some reason the fog gate didn't clear. That wasn't fun, but it was still a memorable experience. After that, we have the Burnt Ivory King. As I said in the DLC boss video, check it out. There is nothing like this boss fight, and it alone makes the entirety of Dark Souls 2 worth playing. So of course it makes this entire DLC worth playing. If I'm giving that high a compliment to the DLC, what brings it down? I guess it's the worst level in gaming followed by the worst boss fight in the series. DLC's optional boss is Lundalen, the King's Bricks. Nothing about this boss is original. Hell, the design of the boss is a complete ripoff of a better boss within this very same DLC. I'll go into detail racing this absolute f***ing waste of time and sanity another time, and I'll be doing the same with the frigid f***ing outskirts. Genuinely, who looks at Black Ops 2's transit and thinks, you know what this needs? Lightning reindeers. Let's just get to the next entry before I lose my mind. Number 4, Crown of the Old Iron King, Dark Souls 2. The second DLC of the game, and its best. Crown of the Old Iron King had the advantage the other two DLCs on this list didn't, and I was having two brilliant boss fights. Fiona is a fun difficulty spike, and Cyrilon is a fun samurai battle in the best boss room in the series. The thing that dragged down the DLC is the exact same thing that dragged down the other two in the game, the optional boss. That being said, Blue Smelter Demon is better than both Gangsward and Lundzalan, even if the runback is still terrible. You know who else has an atrocious runback? Cyrilon! What even is this mess? Why are there fire frogs here? Genuinely, the only thing that makes this DLC a far jump from the top three is the fact that they never put a bonfire just before the fog gates. That all being said, I was pleasantly surprised at how decent the Blue Smelter Demon was, and Fume Knight was a much better fight than I was expecting. Number 3, The Old Hunters Bloodborne. A lot of people would put this at number 1, and they'd be very much correct for doing so. The top 3 can be put in any order in my opinion, it's just a matter of preference as to which comes first and which comes third. The Old Hunters DLC is phenomenal for the most part. The Hunter's Nightmare is fittingly grotesque and challenging with all them hunters around, losing their minds. The Research Hall is a fun looking level that's just a bit too confusing for my taste. And the Fishing Hamlet is the toughest level I've ever come across in a game. One thing that I love about the Old Hunters, which sets it apart from the DLCs lower than the ranking, is this intricate story linking the DLC lore with the main game significantly. And to talk about that, we have to talk about the bosses. Living failures are the least significant part of the lore, which is both fitting and relatable. The other four bosses though, they are the lore. Lawrence, Ludwig and Maria are the legendary hunters on par with German in terms of how memorable they are in the lore. And the Orphan of course is the product of the tragedy that took place in the fishing hamlet. While Lawrence and Living Failures are quite lackluster in terms of the fights, Ludwig, Maria and Orphan make up for that and then some. Those three are legit in my top 10 favourite bosses in the series which I plan on doing a video on after Shadow of the Earth Tree comes out. All in all, the Old Hunters DLC is a must play. If you thought Bloodborne was good before, this will enhance that feeling tenfold. Number 2, The Ringed City, Dark Souls 3. There's no better way of starting a DLC than by getting a thousand arrow holes in your body. But seriously though, while I'm not the biggest fan of the level design in The Ringed City, that's more of a Dark Souls 3 problem than one exclusive to the DLC. This is the last DLC that we've had until Shadow of the Earth Tree comes out, and you could tell that they wanted to go out with a bang. We do get a bit of everything here, a dragon flying around the place until we fight it as a boss, unique NPCs, bloody patches again, and unpoison the swamp? That's major character development on Miyazaki's part, and to top it all off we have four bosses, three of which are in genuine contention as the best fight in the series. Demon Prince is severely underrated, although I think he's underrated to the point where he can be a bit overrated, ironically. And I've always spoken about how much I adore Dark Eater Medea and Slave Knight Gale. While the Old Hunters has lore that links strongly back to the main game, the Ring City's lore links back throughout the entire trilogy. We have links to Dark Souls 1 with the likes of Philianor, and we have Earthen Peak returning for Dark Souls 2. Oh, there's the Poison Swamp. I guess the Miyazaki giveth, and the Miyazaki taketh away. 
With so much good, what can take away the number one spot for the Ring City? Half Light, Spear of the Church. That's what. Another NPC boss fight with one of the only enemies more annoying than dogs, Painting Guardians. If you have PvP Half Light, it can go either way. But for those who can't do PvP, we get the NPC version. And oh boy, he's a f***ing jerk. It's a shame my favourite boss fight is stuck behind one of my least favourites, but that's the only thing that keeps it from being number one. And number one, Artorias of the Abyss, Dark Souls. One thing that Dark Souls 1 DLC has over everything else is consistency. Everything works, from the Sanctuary Guardian at the start to Manus at the end. All four fights here are a cut above the main game, as are the majority of the NPCs. Marvelous Chester, Hawkeye Gale, Elizabeth the Mushroom, and Lord Blade Kiaran. They are some of the most memorable characters in the story. The way it links back to the main game is also awesome. If you look at the design of Ilyseal and Darkroot Garden slash Darkroot Basin, you see that they're practically one and the same. And the story of Ilyseal is a haunting parallel to New London Ruins. When talking about the DLC, we have to talk about its cover boy, the great Knight Artorius, the Abyss Walker. In a way, Artorius is Dark Souls 1, as he's most likely the man on the cover of the original Dark Souls. And the story can all be linked back to him, much like the entire trilogy can be linked back to Gwyn. One of these links is with Sith, and the DLC does the one thing that I don't think any other DLCs have, and that's to give you an alternative cutscene if you free Sith before fighting them. Also, this is the first time you could have a boss as a summon before fighting them as a boss, which is pretty neat. Like I said, it's not one thing standing above the rest which makes this DLC awesome, it's the consistency of every aspect of the DLC. Not to mention this has the best cutscene in the entire series with Hawkeye Go sniping Calamite like it's nothing. What a chad. Anyway, that's my ranking. What's yours? Let me know in the comments. Also, let me know where you'd expect Shadow of the Earth Tree to place. I personally think it'll be somewhere between Artorias of the Abyss and Crown of the Old Iron King. While you're at it, please like and subscribe for more. Like I said, I would love to get this channel monetized, and it would mean so much if you could spread the word. Until next time, my friends.